Matthew chapter 14 verses. I'm going to read more verses than I would normally read. I just want to read this whole story on today. Matthew chapter 14. It's all good in the hood today. Y'all good? Y'all excited? Y'all looking a little refreshed? Y'all didn't have to set up sound this morning and Old Malachi over there, he, he gonna go home today and be like, I got so much energy. What do I do with the rest of my day? I didn't have to set up drums, tear down drums. We might well just had two services. I mean, I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> Matthew chapter 14, thank y'all for joining us this morning. If you're a first time or second time guest, we appreciate you. And guess what? We got a gift for you. Um, just go to the next steps area after service. I've preached this message before some years ago, but I, I think it was something that, that we needed for where we are. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and it reads, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the town verse 14 when he went ashore he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick when it was evening the disciples came to him and said this is a desolate place and the day is now over send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves but Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. On your way down, find somebody that looks way better than you and tell them I'm more than enough. I'm more than enough. So next weekend, we the church celebrates 10 years of ministry. Now, when God called me to pastor... Um, I immediately said yes to the calling, immediately. Um, I didn't know when I would become a pastor. I didn't know how I would become a pastor or where, even in what state. I didn't know if I would pastor in Texas or if it would even be in another state, Georgia, or something else, because we were even looking at moving to Georgia prior to launching um, the church. One thing I did know was that I was called. Some people have a testimony of how God told them to do something and they ran from it. But for me, fighting for my call, or running from my calling, or fighting because of my calling, it just, that wasn't my testimony. Because I knew that I had heard God clearly tell me that I was a pastor. So while I never questioned my call, I did question how impactful and successful I would be. Before you just kind of chalked it up and be like, Pastor Wood had some struggle with low self-esteem. Th th think about it. Th th these are some of the things that, that, that I was thinking about. All I had was a prison GED. So I questioned, would people with degrees want to follow me and listen to me week after week? I, I, don't you think that's a valid concern or, or, or a, val a, val a, valid, a valid thought? I had two felonies and a four-year prison stint on my resume. So I questioned, would people feel I was worthy enough to sit or stand at the sacred desk on Sunday morning as a lead pastor? I was much younger. I was not married that long. We had one baby. So I questioned, 
would older people want to follow me? Would, would husbands want to follow me? Would fathers see me as someone they could follow? So while I never questioned if I heard God, what I did question was, was I enough, Taylor? I believe that's where many of us find ourselves. God tells you what to do next, and we can't question the directive. We know for a fact it was him. You heard God tell you to start the business. You heard God tell you to go back to school you, and get your next degree. You heard God tell you to write the book. You heard God tell you to write the movie. You heard God tell you to start the ministry, move to a new city, start the mentoring group, or start the press circle on your job. You know you heard him clearly, Rolanda, but now you're stuck. You're not stuck because you wonder if it was God. You're stuck because you wonder if you're qualified. You wonder if you're capable. You wonder if you're able. The question you're really asking yourself is, am I enough? Well, I believe I have the answer for you in one sentence this morning. My first point, write it down, take a picture. If God calls you to it, you have more than enough to do it. That's somebody's sermon. They can just wrap it up right there. Go ahead and give your offering in the black box on the way out and just say, thank you, Pastor. That's all I needed. If God calls you to it, you have more than enough to do it. Why would God call us to do something and us not be equipped to it regardless of how we examine ourselves? This is our, for me, this is our anniversary message. Link Church. Why would God give us a building? Why would he plant us in DeSoto and then not give us enough to accomplish the vision and the mission that he's given us? Listen, it may feel like we don't have enough at times, but guess what? We got enough just to do exactly what God has called us to do. Do. Ministry leaders, it may feel like sometimes you don't have enough people to walk out the vision, but I believe and declare today that for this season, in this chapter, you have exactly what you need. Will I get tired? Yes. Will I get exhausted? Yes. But that's what vacations and rest is for. That's what recuperation is for. But I believe that we have enough today to accomplish what God has called us to do today. Tomorrow may change, and guess what? When the vision changes, when he adds more to it, guess what he's going to do? He's going to add more provision to it, Casey. When the vision changes, he's going to add more provision to it. Guess what? He'll give you the vision first, and you start walking, and then he provides. Somebody shout, I'm more than enough. I believe that our text today can help us, me, you see, what God can do with what appears. To be not enough. We're just going to walk through the text. Is that okay? You know, y'all don't like to come to Bible study, so we're going to have Bible study on Sunday morning. Somebody said, well, we don't have it. Well, we're going to start having it in October. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat into a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot. So he says, when Jesus heard this, our text starts off with a glimpse into the humanity of Jesus by revealing the reaction to the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. Upon hearing of John's death, he was hurt. So what did he want to do? He wanted to go be alone. Jesus hurt? That lets me know that being hurt and needing healing is not a measuring stick for your spirituality. It's a measuring stick for your humanity. <laughs> Grieving is part of life. Hurt, being hurt is part of life. It doesn't mean because I want to sit in the bed and because I'm grieving, because I'm going through, because I'm struggling. It does not always mean that is a measuring stick for how mature I am in Christ or how strong I am spiritually. Look at your neighbor and say, it only means that you're human, baby. And you and your hum human self, every now and then, we all need a hug. Every now and then, we all hurt. Every now and then, we all struggle. Every now and then, we just need somebody to say, I'm praying for you, but not just say it, but you actually at home praying for me. All of us need prayer. All of us need love. All of us need encouragement. The pastor need encouragement. The first lady need encouragement. The worship team need encouragement. The prophets, the apostles, the bishop, the musicians need encouragement. The ushers need it. We all need to be encouraged. We all hurt. Why? Because we're all human. 
We're not in our spiritual warfare series anymore, but just think about it. When you are hurting, when you are grieving, that's a perfect time for the devil to come in to, to attack your spirituality. Look at you and your crying self. You shouldn't be here. Look at somebody say, the devil is alive. Okay, no more look at your neighbors. That's all I got for you, all right? Even Jesus hurt. The writer Matthew made a specific notation that they followed him on foot. Some, that, that knocked a whole lot of y'all out in Jesus' day right there, just because they followed him on foot. Not donkeys, but foot. Here's a nugget for you right here. At times, following Jesus is inconvenient. At times, following Jesus is inconvenient. Too many of us want a convenient salvation. We want a convenient relationship with God, and we want a convenient calling. Too many of us, we only come to church when it's convenient. Everything has to be going well. My money got to be right, or I ain't coming to church. My money got to be right, or I ain't reading my Bible. My relationship with my boo got to be right, or I ain't having a prayer life, or I ain't come in the Bible study. Everything for too many of us who profess to be Christians, everything has to be perfect in our life for us to continue to serve God. But serving God is not always convenient. Somebody shout serving God is not always convenient. Your pastor gets up before you get up in the morning and he prays for you. Your worship leaders, your band, your AV people, they got up two hours early before most of you just so that they could get in here. The ushers and greeters came on a Saturday to sweep and mop and vacuum. How many of you would rather be out with your family on Saturday than to be here vacuuming a church? They chose to understand that serving is not always convenient. Verse 14, I, I, I'm almost to the message. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As his boat docks and Jesus gets to shore, he sees what? The crowd. Now, he's supposed to be resting. He's supposed to be taking a break from ministry because he's hurting and he's grieving his cousin's death. But yet, in the midst of his broken heart, he sees people that are broken. And he remembers the call that is so much bigger than me, that it's not about me, but it's about the people. And so he begins to teach them all day long, and he healed them, the Bible says, specifically, from the sun up to the sun going down. This lets me know that Jesus cares about our situation. If he was here on earth and he saw broken people and he says, you know what, I'm going to throw my vacation and my rest and my time one-on-one -on -one away so I can deal and minister to these people and heal these people, I believe that he's still saying the same today. But he doesn't need a rest. He doesn't need a vacation. So he's always available. But it lets me know that when my heart is broken, Jesus cares about it. When I'm sick, Jesus cares about it. When I'm struggling financially, Jesus cares about it. The Bible lets us know that we don't have a high priest that cannot be touched by what? The feelings of our infirmities. When we are going through Jesus Christ is saying, oh, look at Tammy. I can't believe it. My heart is broken because her heart is broken. Look at that mother. Her heart is broken. Jesus is sitting on the throne saying, my heart is broken. We have a priest that is interceding on our behalf. So when I'm hurting and I can't even pray, I know that Jesus is praying for me. When I'm going through and the weights of this life are so heavy that I can barely carry them. I know that maybe nobody else is thinking about me, but I got a Savior who died on the cross for me, who's seated at the right hand of the Father, who is saying, give my son strength, God the Father. Give my daughter strength. Look at somebody and say, Jesus cares about you and your situation. Now, when it was evening, verse 15, the disciples came and said, this is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus was just testing them. But you know how some of y'all are? Y'all just too smart for y'all own good, right? So with their smart self, they decided they knew what was best for the people. So they wanted to become Jesus' advisors. Come on. That's some of y'all right there, right? Me too. Some of y'all said, no, I can point out about seven of y'all right now. They said, I know you be advising Jesus all week long. 
<laughs> mistake number one that the disciples make. Can we learn from their mistakes? Yeah. They took their plan to Jesus and expected him to bless it. <laughs> they took their plan. They wrote down their vision. Put it together real nice, real pretty. And said, here God, bless it. I wonder how many of y'all mad at God right now because he ain't blessed the plans you wrote down. But you, but you quoting scriptures over it, right? What scriptures you quoting over your vision right now? Y'all ain't got none? Come on, you got it on your mirror. You getting up every day. I wrote the vision down, and I made it plain. <laughs> what, what does that verse really mean? You wrote your vision down. You didn't write his vision down. Some of y'all wrote a wish down. A wish, a you, you 37 years old, still writing Christmas wish list. Y'all remember when we was little? Now some of y'all, y'all y'all ain't gonna, y'all, y'all, y'all not gonna tell you, you're not gonna remember this, right? So when we were little, some of us, we had these big books, these J.C. Penney's books and different things like that. And they had the toy section in it, right? And it came every Christmas, it was this thick. Y'all was online, you know, when y'all some of y'all was online, okay? Y'all online babies, okay? <laughs> we had the big book and we had this whole we go through it and we had our piece of paper and mom and dad said, write your Christmas list down and we going through there writing down all this stuff. Four hundred dollar trucks and car, car we want me to get none of that stuff. Had two or three pages of wish lists. Now some of us, maybe because we got used to that, we carry that into our adult life. And that's how we deal with God now. We write these three-page wish lists. We ain't wrote no vision or his vision down. We've written our vision down. So I, I'll confess, I've been there too. I've been there too. So when I, before I launched the church, I wrote what's called a prospectus, right? You write a prospectus and you talk about what the mission and the purpose of the church is and what you're going to do, how much money you need, and we send it to, to other pastors who can support the church before we launch, right? So I had my whole, I had my whole 24 month planned out. Guess what? So we started our church with, I don't know, six or seven, seven people we was doing Bible study with. So I put a year two. We was going to be running 150. A year, 24 months. At 24 months, we running 150. That's the plan. Oh, go. Hi, ya. I felt it in my spirit when I typed it up. That was the Lord, okay? That's what I thought, right? So by 24 months, we're going to be running 150, all right? So when we finally got to 24 months, okay, 10 over here, 10 over here, 10 over here, 10 over here. Okay, we got 40. So I'm like nine, what, I'm 110 people short. So did God miss it or did I miss it? <laughs> okay? I, I wrote a wish list down. That wasn't God's vision. Can I change the way you do it? You sit down and you, and you have a prayer life and you say, God, what do you want me to write down? What, what, what do you want me to write down? And it's because some of us frustrated because you wrote down that by 25 you was going to be married. By 27 you was going to have your first house with the white picket fence. You was getting a mixed crazy dog. You was gonna get a poodle and mix them with a rock waller and you know, you know, y'all be listen, y'all be be afraid of these dogs. They may be cute, but they crazy, okay? Cross breeding, okay? I don't know, I don't know if that's of the Lord, okay? <laughs> but you wanted your little crossbred dog, your white picket fence, and you was gonna have your pool, and by 30 you was gonna have your first kid. And now you're looking up at 32 and like, dang, ain't nobody even asked me for my number in two years. And the one that did was like, please. <laughs> like, Lord, what happened to the plan? It, was, it wasn't God's plan. It, it, was, it, was, it was your plan. It wasn't God's vision. It was, it was God's vision. So that, that, it wasn't God's vision. That, that was the mistake that they made. What they should have said is, okay, Father, what should we do? What, what, what should we do since you are the one who knows the future, since you are the one who has all the power? What should we do? But Jesus said in response to their vision, they don't need to go away. That's pointless. What you're trying to do is not even necessary for us to accomplish the goal. They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, but God, we only have five loaves and two 
fish. So Jesus said, the plan you have ain't even necessary. <laughs> we used to sing a song in the choir in the church that I grew up that said, why are you trying to figure it out when God's already worked it out? And then look, Faith was ready to get up and start singing and directing the choir and everything else, <laughs> right? Why are you trying to figure it out when God already worked it out? They wasted their time trying to figure it out. When what they should have been doing was just saying, God, what, what you want us to do? What's the best method? What's the process? How many of you have, made, have wasted months, days, the past year trying to figure out something that you ain't even asked God yet about? What they questioned was, is what we have enough to do what you told us to do? Their but says they didn't believe it was enough. Mistake number two, they focused on what they had and not who they were with. Right, right, write that mistake down. That was the mistake the disciples made. He said, well, why we got to go? Why well, we got to send the people away into the city? We got enough right here. No, we don't. Have you seen the fish? And these were somewhat more, they weren't the fish that you get from Mason's or one of these, y'all catfish floor is a place that y'all go, get y'all a whole fish, y'all go to Jamaica and get the whole fish with the head. That's nasty. <laughs> it wasn't five of those. It was more closer to sardine size. It was more closer to that size. You're like, we're going to feed all these people? And 5,000, this just the men. That wasn't even including the women and the children. We're we going to feed all these people with, with five sardines and some crackers. That don't, that don't add up. And then you're telling us that's, that's all we need? Mistake number two was what? They focused on what they had and not who they were with. Here's the crazy part when you really think about the context of this situation. They had already seen Jesus do at least 13 miracles. A as they sit here, some of y'all, hope y'all get so convicted you run out of here. <laughs> as they question, how can we feed this many people with this little bit? You want to know what they had already seen? They had already seen Jesus heal a leper. They had already seen Jesus raise up a paralyzed man. They had already seen him raise a daughter from the dead. They had already seen him bring two blind men to sight. They had already seen him give voice to a mute man. They had seen Jesus calm a storm at the voice. Peace be still. They had seen all of that. And yet in this moment, when God says go and feed all these people, they're saying, but what we have is not enough. Because they focused on what they could see tangibly and they forgot about who they were with. Sometimes you just need a flashback of what God has already done. I hope that encourages about seven people right there who you're struggling with your faith on believing that what God has called you to do, what God has showed you you can do. I'm not capable. I'm not able. But how did you even get here to the place that you are? It's because he told you to do something 10 years ago. You stepped out on faith. That's why you got the degree. He told you to go do something seven years ago. You stepped out on faith. You put the application in, and that's why you got the job. If he told you you could do it then, and he made a way out of nowhere, why do you not believe that what God has already done, he can do again? The trick of the enemy, one of the tricks of the enemy is to get you to take your eyes off of Jesus and focus on yourself. That's what he wants you to do. He knows if you're always looking at Jesus, you're like, this is a miracle worker. He can do anything. But the moment you take your eyes off of him and put it on yourself in the mirror, I'm not good looking enough. I don't have enough money to accomplish that. I don't have the support to accomplish that. I don't have the degree to accomplish that. I don't have the support team to accomplish that. Who are you looking at? You're looking at yourself. And you know what? In reality, you're right. The disciples didn't have enough to do it. 
It wasn't them. It was who they were with. Who are you with? <laughs> the goal is not to trust in me. It's to trust in God. The vision is not to trust in yourself to accomplish it. It's to trust in the God who is sending you. Link Church, I promise you, if God sends us, we have more than enough. There's two main nuggets I want to share from this story. He says in verse 18, and he said, bring them here to me. The key phrase here is bring them here to me. The fish and the five loaves were not enough alone, but they were more than enough when they got into the hands of a miracle worker. The key to it all was the boy releasing the little that he had. First nugget I want to give you, write this down. When you're in Jesus' hands, you're more than enough. When, you're, when you put yourself, your gifts, your talents, the vision that he gives you, when you say, here am I, Lord, send me, you are then, Victoria, more than enough. Your worth and your value to this world is not in who you are. It's in who you are in Christ. When I'm in Christ, I'm more than enough. When I'm in Christ, my gift is more than enough. When I'm in Christ, the money is more than enough. As long as I'm doing what he told me to do, he is going to make it more than enough. Somebody shout, God, make miracles reign in my life. Sometimes God will use a miracle, but that's his business. We got to get in the habit of staying out of God's business. <laughs> Y'all too nosy, yeah. worrying about how God going to do it. You losing sleep behind God's business. That ain't your business. Your nosy self. Wonder how Jesus going to do it. Jesus, I just want to know what y'all in there talking about. <laughs> you know, little kids, when, 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 when you're at home or you got some, some, some guests over, and y'all go in the room, the kids always want to know what's going on on the other side of that door. Just nosy. Nothing in here pertains to you. Just know you're going to eat when the food ready, and we're going to make sure you got all the games and everything you need to entertain yourself while we at this gathering. I believe that's what God is saying to somebody. Just stay in your place. We in the room. We working on this. As a matter of fact, it was already worked out before I even gave you the commission, before I even gave you the mission. So, no, we're not even in here talking about your today. We out here planning your tomorrow. Why are you worried about how God going to make it work today? When you're in Jesus' hands, you're more than enough. Verse 19, and I'm almost done. I'm out of here like last year. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves, the two fish. He looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke it. He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowd. And they did what? They all ate and were satisfied. And it wasn't even just enough. It says in verse 19, and they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. So when the fish and the loaves were in Christ's hands, he broke it up just like he needed to break it up. And this leads me to my last point. What you see as lack, God sees as an opportunity for miracles, signs, and wonders. Somebody got to take that home right there. What you see as lack. Can we read that together? On the count of three, let's see it. And I want you to put... I, what I want you to say, what I see. All right, you ready? One, two, three. What I see. Why can't God use you for a miracle? Why can't God use you for a sign, a wonder, so that somebody else can see what God can do? So that you can get on social media, and instead of talking about the, the, the president, who the next president going to be, <laughs> instead of talking about how mad you are that the Cowboys about to win another Super Bowl, <laughs> and, and, instead of talking about all this stuff that's worthless, what if you could be able to get on social media and talk about how God made a way out of nowhere? Yeah. About how you questioned how God was going to do it. 
about how you questioned that God was going to be able to change the situation and make it better and make it right. If you question about yourself and how God was going to use you with your limited skill set and your limited degrees and your limited money and your limited support system and you didn't see a good marriage and daddy was never in your life and mama worked five-time job and she never told you she loved you, but then yet God used you because what you see as not enough, what you see as lack, God is saying that's a perfect opportunity. For me to show this generation and the next that I still do miracles, that I still break, make signs come out so that people will know that I am real. I believe the word today for our house, and if you're here today, not by chance, for you, step out. Step out. Step out on what? Your plan? Nope. Your wish list? No. The vision that God actually gave you. The vision that was birthed inside of you through prayer. Step out. Just one step at a time. You're going to be surprised. I've seen them do it. All it takes. One step. Two step. Three step. And while you're focusing on your next step, Emily, you look up. And he's made a way for the next four or five steps. And th this is the crazy part. This is how it works. Like, I'm starting here. This is my starting point. God already has it in play. Until he gets here, until she gets here, I'm not revealing what's next. I'm not sending provision until he gets here. I'm not sending the support team until he gets here, until she gets here. I'm not sending, giving her the next part of the blueprint until she gets here. So the question is, while you're here, what are you going to do? Because this is your faith move. This is where you got to believe. That the loaves and the fish is enough for me to at least start walking. Because I have no idea if provision is coming here. I don't know how many steps I got to make before the provision comes. All I got to know is that I just got to keep walking. And before all of a sudden I hit it, it's like a game. You hit one point in one place and then all of a sudden you get an extra life. You get provision, you get support, you get more vision, and you get here and God says, all right, now, keep going. I got something else. You keep walking here. And then by the time you get here, that's when God says, oh, I trusted you enough to get there. I've trusted you enough to get here. You showed me that you can obey me. You passed the test there. You passed the test here. Now I can show you. Now you can come down. And he's leading me, and he's guiding me. Because I'm trusting him one step at a time. And at each point, he decides, now they're ready for the next step and the next turn. Then he says, turn here. Oh, while you're here, go ahead and bless her. Use your gift that I gave you for her. Look, I had to go through all of that just to get here. <laughs> I fought right here. The devil tried to block me right here. The devil came in and tried to mess with my wife and my husband right here. The devil tried to come in my child right here. And I almost said, forget all of that. I need to focus on my house. I need to focus on my job. I need to focus on everything that's going on with me. Maybe I need to stop going to Bible study right there. Maybe I need to stop praying right there. But because I didn't give up and I got here, now God says you can bless somebody else. And while you're here, you might as well bless her. While you're here. Now I can trust you with more. But it all started with you being willing to leave here. You was worried how you was going to minister to that person, how you was going to fulfill that, how you was going to pay for that, how you was going to provide. And God said, I just got to get you to go. You're more than enough. But your confidence is not in yourself. Your confidence is in your seat. Because I'm seated in Christ. <laughs> Somebody shout, if God calls you to it, you're more than enough to do it. Stand to your feet. God, we thank you this morning for the encouragement, for the challenge. The challenge to trust you with what to us looks like lack. Thank you this morning for the challenge to trust you 
with what to us looks like it's not enough. Our gifting sometimes looks like it's not enough. Our mental capacity to comprehend and create looks like and feels like sometimes it's not enough. Our degree feels like it's not enough for what you've called us to. The gifts, the talents, and the skills, it just doesn't seem like it's not enough. It doesn't look like the people that I admire. When I look at other people in this industry, when I look at other people in this field, it seems like they have so much more than what I have right now. But I realize today, God, that I have you. And it's not me that I need to trust in anymore. It's not what I can see in the mirror that I need to trust in anymore. But it's the God who I serve that I trust in. It's the God who controls the vision. It's the God who controls the mission. It's the God who controls the vision that I can trust in because when I can just give you what appears to be lack, you can take it and you can feed the masses. You can deliver the masses. You can minister to the masses. And when it's all said and done, we'll realize and we'll look around and we'll see that it was not even just enough. But it was more than enough. So we thank you in advance that as we step out on faith and move out of the starting blocks, that as we trust you, you will take our little in what appears to be less, and you will make it more than enough. And we give you the honor and the glory for the results. In Jesus' mighty, awesome, magnificent name, we pray. Amen. Come on, give God a praise right there. Listen, I don't know where you are spiritually, but before you can give God, come on ministers, before you can give God your gifts, before you can give God your talents, so that he can make your lack more than enough, you got to give God your heart. So when we count down from three, if you want to accept Jesus Christ, as your personal Lord and Savior, you can come down now. Our ministers will pray with you and we'll lead you in prayer. Maybe that's not you and you're here and you say, hey, I've given my life to Christ before, but I do need to rededicate my life to him. So if you're here this morning and you want to rededicate your life, you want to make a public confession because, hey, life got hard. You walked away from Christ. You walked away from church. You stopped reading your Bible. You stop praying, you stop fasting, you stop giving, you stop serving. Maybe you're not here by accident or by chance this morning, but you're here because God is saying, hey, you need to rededicate your life. If that's you, when we count down from three, you can come down and give God a crazy praise. Or maybe you're here and you say, hey, I'm here on this first Sunday. I like what y'all doing. I like this. I think it feels like home to me. Maybe you need to make this church your, your home today. Don't think about it. Don't pray about it. You already know God has already laid it in your heart. I mean, don't pray about it, but God has already laid it in your heart. For some of you, you may not even need to pray about it. You know what it is. So when we count down from three, if you want to accept Jesus Christ for the first time, or if you want to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ, or if you want to join the Link Church, now will be your time. Three, two, one. Give God a crazy praise as you come. Come on, come on. Don't just let us come by ourselves. We know there's somebody else. We know there's somebody else. We know there's somebody else. Come on. All right, come on. She'll pray with you. Anybody else coming that want to rededicate their life, that want to join the church? Repeat this prayer after me. Maybe you didn't come down, or maybe you're watching online. You can accept Jesus Christ right there where you are, even in your kitchen, while you're making bacon and eggs, or you're sitting in your cubicle watching this. Just repeat this prayer after me. God, I confess that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I believe that you came down from heaven and put on sinful flesh. I believe that you got on the cross with me on your mind. I believe that you went into the grave, but three days later, you got up with all power in your hands. I believe that you're alive today, seated at the right hand of the Father. I invite you into my life to be my Savior and to be my Lord. Fill me with the Holy Ghost 
and never let me be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, praise God for the souls that are welcome into heaven. Listen, maybe you didn't come down because you didn't need to give your life to Christ, but you need prayer. Our altar is going to stay open, so if you want our ministers to pray with you once we dismiss, you can come down and you can get some one-on-one -on -one prayer if you need encouragement. Don't be embarrassed. We got time. We'll wait for you. God bless you. We love you. We'll be back here again next Sunday for our 10-year anniversary celebration. We got the gala on Friday night. We got the, the, the anniversary picnic on Saturday. And then we're back here Sunday with an amazing guest speaker and an amazing guest worship leader. So don't be afraid. Bring some friends. Let's pack out the house. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you soon.